everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Entrepreneurs in a Game podcast. Today is a first for me because it's my first return guest ever on this show, and I'm really pleased to welcome back Nathan Hirsch. He's an entrepreneur and expert in remote hiring and e-commerce. Most recently, Nathan co-founded FreeUp in 2015 with an initial $5,000 investment. He scaled to $12 million per year in revenue and was then acquired in 2019. So he sold that business. And now he's a co-founder of Outsource School, a company working to educate entrepreneurs on how to effectively hire and scale with virtual assistants through in-depth courses. Nathan has appeared on over 300 podcasts, is a social media personality, and loves sharing advice for scaling remote businesses. Nathan, it's such a pleasure to welcome you back. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me back. Excited to be your first return guest, and uh, lots happened since we last talked. Which is why I've asked you to come back, because we were having a little email conversation, weren't we? And then, you know, I found out that you'd sold this business and you were working on something new. And I know that since we last spoke, you know, you've been working on bigger and bigger stuff. Your your vision has grown bigger. And that's why I wanted you to come back and share your mindset and how it's helped you to build a big business, sell it, and then start something new. So just, um, I'd just love to start by finding out, you know, finding out, what was it that helped you in terms of your thinking that helped you to create such a huge success out of FreeUp? And it's something that I use myself in order to hire VAs. It was a phenomenal company. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think the, the fundamentals of it, of treating people well, both the clients and the freelancers, obviously the vetting and making sure that, hey, listen, 99% of the time, things are going to go great. If something does happen that's in our control, out of control, we're just going to make it right. No questions asked and quickly. And that was the foundation of the business. But in order to grow the business, you need a little bit more than that. And I really like our blueprint for organic marketing because for us, we didn't dump that much money into ads. We were spending about $1,000 a month on ads. So for an eight-figure business, that's not that much. And most of that was retargeting. So what we did was we created a good affiliate program. Uh, clients who referred free up to other people got 50 cents for every hour that we built to them forever. So we would put that on our website. We'd end every phone call by telling everyone about the affiliate program. I'd mention it to podcast hosts and all that. And so that was the foundation. And from there... I went on podcasts, so I got in front of lots of, of thousands of people that were ideal clients for us, but I also built relationships with people like you, podcast hosts, and we're able to figure out different ways to work each, work with each other going forward. Obviously, podcasts are, are good for backlinks and other stuff like that. Then we put out content. We put out content every single day. Those of you that follow me, Nathan Hirsch on Facebook or LinkedIn or the real Nate Hirsch on Instagram or Twitter, um, I put out content three times a day, seven days a week about hiring and that all kind of sets a baseline. Next, networking. I, I try to network with three new entrepreneurs every single day. No pitching, no selling, just getting to know them, seeing if I can add value to them. If there's some way to work together, great. If not, I, I just enjoy meeting people in the space. And as you continue to meet more and more and more people and the years go by, you build a pretty large network that knows about you, knows about your services, knows about other people that might need your services that can make introductions. And then lastly, one of the big foundations is partnerships. So we looked for other people in the space that did something different than what we do, but had the same core audience. So with FreeUp, for example, we started off going after Amazon sellers. So we went to other Amazon software companies. They didn't provide freelancers. We didn't provide Amazon software. We would do content swaps with them. We'd write for their blog. They'd write for ours. They'd blast us to their newsletter. We'd blast them to ours. Podcasts, YouTube videos, back and forth. And we would organize it and make it easy for them and reach out to them every quarter, every half year and say, hey, what do you want to do together? And through that, we not only built great relationships, but we also got in front of more and more people. We got better known in the industry. And when you combine all that together, that is organic marketing at its finest. And if you want to add ads and other stuff on top of that, even more power to you. But that's really the same blueprint that we're following with Outsource School, going on podcasts, building partnerships. I continue to network even when I sold free up and, and all of that really comes together. Yeah. Now, what struck you about me when we had our last conversation is that you've got a phenomenally strong mindset. You know, you go, you go in there and you just find solutions to problems. It doesn't seem to phase you and you just keep going. And I don't know whether that's something that you were just born with or something that you developed along as you, you know, as you got um, further into business. How has that been for you? 
It's funny. So I started off selling baby products on Amazon, right? So uh, me as a college, single college guy selling baby products, people thought I was crazy. People had no idea what Amazon was. I remember like a girl in one of my classes looking over my shoulder and I'm listing baby products and she gave me some like weird look. So I think at the beginning, like that first year of becoming an Amazon seller, I just became numb to like all the adversity. So when it got time to actually market and brand, because I didn't have to do that on Amazon, but I had to do that with free up, I would go after podcast hosts and get rejected. I would go after partnerships and get rejected. I would try to network with people and they would say no. And and to me, it wasn't get angry, get aggressive. How dare you not want to talk to me? It was, all right, I get you're busy. I understand it. I'm going to follow up with you and in a non-aggressive way. And I'm going to try to find solutions and make introductions and add value to you. And I still get rejected every single day, every single week it happens, but I'm much more focused on finding the solutions and finding the ways to, for it to work out. I mean, I think I, I, I had a, a few buddies of mine introduce me to a few podcast hosts over the weekend. And this morning I woke up and two of them said, hey, it's not a fit. Just what I'm doing isn't in line with their audience, which I respect. And then a few hours later, I get some emails from other people that I booked it and got on the podcast. So you have to get over those failures pretty quickly. You have to not take it personally. Don't get angry. Don't get aggressive. Just keep moving forward. And it seems to be that one of the secrets to your success is networking, prolific networking, and then being consistent in the follow-up. Now, I'm pretty good at networking and reaching out to people. I, I love reaching out to people, but I'm not so good in the follow-up. How do you do that? I mean, how, how first of all, a practical level and also on a, on a mindset level. Uh, on a practical level, you you kind of stay organized. And I try to network with people that are, are one or two steps away from my network, if that makes sense. So for example, if I go on a podcast, I'll try to connect with the other people that have also been on that podcast. So I'm one step away. And then as I'm going through and I'm listening to the podcast or I'm seeing my feed, I'm kind of seeing the same people over and over again, which will allow me to follow up or comment or engage, stuff like that. Um, on, on a bigger level, sometimes you, you just get creative. I remember one podcast that I really wanted to get on. I knew it would be great for free up and I got rejected for two and a half years. And finally, I was like, all right, I'm going to do everything possible to go on it. So I found every person in his community that I could find that was a client of free up. And I interviewed them and got their testimonial and got them to show how awesome free up was. And then I sent them all of that. I was like, Hey, people in your community are already using free up. I think it would add a ton of value. And that got me on the podcast. I've actually been on multiple times since then. And I built a relationship with them. So sometimes you kind of have to think out of the box and that could have not worked. He could have still rejected me, but you're, you're, it's almost like, it's not quantity over quality because I'm still going after quality people, but it is, you have to factor in how many people there are. And just because you get rejected by a hundred people doesn't mean that there's not a hundred more people out there that would be a good partner. Yeah, no, that's phenomenal. That's huge. And you, you are a, a, a huge action taker. I can imagine you jumping out of bed in the morning and just banging out emails and, you know, just connecting with people and, you know, it's lunchtime and you've probably done twice as much work as most people. And what is the secret of, of you taking action? So what I've, and this, I've actually tweaked this since I sold free up is figuring out the exact times in the day that I'm most productive and what I want to be doing at those times of the day. So I'll talk about my schedule now because it's more fresh in my head, but I, I used to work out at 4.45 PM. I moved that up till 9 AM, but my most productive time is in the morning. So from, from 6 AM to seven, I walk the dogs, I eat, I have a cup of coffee. I, I meditate. That's like my time to wake up. Although with free up, I kind of just jumped up and got to work. But then from seven to nine, that's my most productive time in the day. So whatever is most important, I'm getting it done there. I'm not going on podcasts. I'm not taking networking calls. I am focused on the biggest priority business-wise of that day. From there, I, I, I've accomplished my biggest thing for the day right then and there. I go to the gym. I take any stress I have out there, come back, and then I found out, hey, Early afternoon, I'm, I like doing my podcast then. I don't like doing them later on the day. I'm tired. I, it's probably not what I want just hanging over my head. Oh, my God, I have this podcast later. So between 11 and, and 2 o'clock, I try to get the podcast done. And then the phone calls where I can walk my dog and be outside and not be tied down to my computer, I do at the end of the day. And, and I didn't just wake up one day and pick that. I kept tweaking and changing and moving stuff around until I found out what my most productive day is. And if anyone's listening right now and you haven't done that, start tweaking and figure out how do I maximize every single day? 
Yeah, and finding your most productive time is really, really good because I know there's times where I just don't want to do what I'm doing and I'm thinking, I'll just take the dog out for a walk, clear my head, and then come back and try and do it again. Right. You said that you meditate. Is that something you do every day or is that something you just do now and then? Brand new. I started it after I sold free up. Really like it. I'm not 100% sure I'm the expert to, to speak on it yet. I know I'm not. Uh, but for me, oh my God, there's so much going on in my head at every, sometimes I just wish I could turn it off. And meditation is just allows me to say, all right, stop everything three to 15 minutes, depending on how long I want to do it that day. Let's clear my head. Let's focus on breathing. Like I get stressed in my shoulders. I'm on a computer all day. Let's just chill, block out the world for a little while and then get back to it. And I'm continuing to learn, learn and more, more and more. And I think it opens up other opportunities as well. But at least me personally, someone who's all over the place, high energy, brain flying around. It's just a good way to, to decompress. Yeah, no, I, I meditate as well. I think it's a f fantastic thing to do. So you interacted with lots of businesses, you know, some smaller, some bigger. Obviously, you've networked with a huge number of people, all the different levels in their businesses. What is the difference between entrepreneurs who really make it, who scale up, you know, get a team, can spend less time in their business while their income is growing, and those who just stay stuck at the same level and don't you know, maybe have the income that they want, haven't got any sense of freedom within their business. What's the difference between those two groups of entrepreneurs in your, for you? So everyone thinks you have to have that great idea, right? The idea that no one else is doing and having a good idea is awesome. It's a plus, but think about how many good ideas there are out there that don't actually turn into big successful businesses. And on the flip side, Look at how many Amazon sellers there are. Look at how many marketing agencies there are. There's a lot of the same business over and over and over. And the ones that succeed are the ones that hire the right people. And my philosophy on hiring is find people that have the same values, the same beliefs as you. I believe in treating people right, customer service, not screwing people over, honoring my word, but find people that have opposite skill sets. The average entrepreneur is only good at one to three things, their core competency. So find business partners, find service providers, find virtual assistants that are good at the things that you're not good at and surround yourself by those people. You can't do it alone. Hiring is the only way up. And hiring a lot of times is the difference between success and failure. Those big agencies that are crushing it, it's not because the owner's working 100 hours a week, it's because they hired really good people. And the ones that have a 20, 40% successful hiring rate they go in circles, they have turnover, they have setbacks. And one kind of final thought on that is you have to treat hiring just like you would any part of your business, just like marketing, just like bookkeeping. You wouldn't just fail at launching a marketing campaign and be like, oh, marketing's not for me. I'm not going to do it anymore. But people do that with hiring all the time. They make a few bad hires. They're like, oh, I can't hire. I don't know how to do it. I'm just going to do everything myself. And you have to change that mentality where hiring is the only way up. And what about those entrepreneurs who are listening and watching to this and thinking, I'm not at the stage of my business where I can afford to hire anyone. So I've just got to carry on doing it all myself. Yeah, and that's true to some extent. I mean, if you don't have a budget, maybe you're getting into entrepreneurship at a first time, you, you do have to get it off the ground, right? You have to talk, go out there, talk to your clients, get feedback, make sure the product is actually good and, and move it forward. But maybe instead of thinking it full-time long-term, think of it part-time long-term. Think of it project-based if you can't afford it. Hey, do I need a new website? Do I need a new logo? Whatever it is. So you can break it down a little bit more. We actually have this cool uh, tool. If you go to outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator, you can put in the numbers of your business and it'll tell you how many virtual assistants you can afford right now. And it's a really cool tool because I've seen lots of people who do go higher and then realize they can't afford it later on. But there, there is a certain time to get it off the ground, to get some revenue, to get some sales, but you should be starting to hire as soon as possible. You're going to have to hire eventually if you want to scale. You might as well start doing that early on. Yeah, no, that, that's really sound advice. So what, what would you recommend as your first hire? Because there are so many different parts of our business, isn't it? Yeah. So for me personally, I, I like to focus on four categories. 
I take bookkeeping off my plate first. I'm not a good bookkeeper. I don't like doing bookkeeping. Any time that I'm spending on bookkeeping, organize my books or anything is a complete waste of time. So I get that off my plate first. And it also gives me a peace of mind where in eight months, I don't have to be like, oh my God, I need to get all my books together for my accountant. And I have a better overall um, understanding of the numbers as I go, as I grow, which you can't do if you don't have a bookkeeper. So that's always number one for me. I just started outdoor school. Bookkeeper was my first hire, just like at free up. I think it was my second hire. Um, then it's customer service. So either getting you out of your inbox. So an executive assistant role, someone who can clear your inbox before you wake up and give you a head start every day. Or if you have more of a customer service facing business, someone to get you out of those emails, out of those phone calls, out of those live chat. So you can focus on higher level stuff. And lastly, last two is social media, someone to help you with scheduling and posting. Super easy, takes up a lot of time, and lead generation. And this is where I get creative. You could be going after podcasts, speaking events. You could be going after partnerships. You could be going after clients. But hiring an affordable VA that you can come up with a good lead generation strategy. And, and anyone that, that wants my lead generation strategy, feel free to, to reach out to me on social media. I'm happy to send it to you. And it's not something you just implement and you start getting sales. It takes tweaking and developing. But to me, that's a lot of fun. It's like, hey, I got this VA. She's five bucks an hour. I'm going to give her three hours a day to go crazy and get me leads. And we'll continue to develop this process. And over time, it can really pay off times 10. Yeah, no, that sounds brilliant. And we will put the link in um, for that lead generation strategy because I think it'll be super useful for everyone here. What is the secret of hiring a great new team member? Yeah, so I break it down into four parts. You got interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. For interviewing, the key, the mistake that everyone makes is only focusing on skill and not focusing enough on attitude and culture. For onboarding, the biggest mistake I see is people just don't do it. They jump right from interviewing to training, and they don't spend the time to, to get on the same page with the person. We call it our SICK method, S-I-C-C. Before we hire them, we offer them the rate, and we go through scheduling. We go through issues. We go through communication. We go through culture. And then I give them a chance to back out. And I'd much rather they back out then than for us to find out two months later it's not a fit. So make sure you actually have some kind of onboarding. And we teach this in our first course. Next is training. The biggest mistake I see there is people not valuing their own time, doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one training. Instead of giving someone a document, having them learn it, having them prove they understand it, you can get them that last 10% or whatever, but really valuing your time at the highest level. And then once you've invested all of this time, energy, money into someone, you got to keep them around. You want them to stick around for years to come. So we call it our BARF method, which is a funny acronym, but it stands for getting them to buy in, showing appreciation, building relationships, and building a family environment. So someone can come around and offer your team $2 an hour more. That happened all the time at FreeUp. But because they bought into your business, because they have a family here, you have a relationship with them, you show appreciation, they're not going to want to leave you. And all of that comes to coming together is what leads to a good hire. Yeah. And that's really important is it building a relationship, taking care of them, looking after them, because then they're going to give so much more back to you. Right. As as your business as free up was growing and, you know, I know you started, you know, with an initial five thousand dollar investment and they became multi million dollar revenue company. Were there times as you were hitting the next level of your success that you felt any resistance, that you felt any fear? Um. I never or, or are you fearless? <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm fearless. I would say I'm I'm very reasonable. So for for me, when I was starting my Amazon business, for example, I I got a college degree. I have this over here. I've never used it, and I was in my back pocket. So what what risks am I really taking? The worst worst chance I'm going to have to go out and get a real job, which I don't want to do. But it's not like I'm ending up on the street. With the Amazon business, I had success and I made a little bit of money and I only invested $5,000 into FreeUp. So what's the worst case scenario that happens with FreeUp? Realistically, not much. I, I probably start another business, try another idea. So for me, it's, it's we're moving forward and, and we're not letting any of that come in because we almost have a backup plan or we know that most businesses fail. And going in, we understand we might have to tweak. And, and kind of same thing with Outsource School. We just sold FreeUp. We're kind of, I won't say playing with house money because I kind of hate that term. But we're trying something. We think it'll add value. We've talked to people. They People seem to like it. And 
I don't think that in five years, it'll look exactly the way that we're imagining it right now, but we want to get it out there. We want to try to help people. And if it doesn't work, we're just going to refund people and move on to something else. And if it does work, we're going to continue to listen to feedback and make it better and better over time. And if you had that mentality, instead of just, Hey, I'm going to dump $250,000 in this business and, and hope it works out. I feel like getting over fear isn't as hard. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, you sort of spoke about not taking things personally. So if something doesn't work out, then, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you're not attaching the meaning. That means I'm a loser. That means there's something wrong with me. You don't attach those meanings so you can move on more quickly. Listen, if you're an entrepreneur, you're weird. I have no no way around that. I mean, you're, you're not normal. Most people go out there and get a job. They don't take any risk. Even if you're taking a small amount of risk, you're different. And if you're worried about what people think about you, if you're worried about being normal or, or anything that or failure or any of that, you're, you're not going to last. You got to get rid of those mentalities. It, it's almost like you against the world. And no matter what the world says, you're, you're not going to take it personally. And I actually have a really kind of a funny story about this. So around, I don't know, year two or three of free up, there was this private, private Facebook group of freelancers and someone like bashed me really, really hard. And I wasn't in the, I wasn't even in this group. So someone told me about it later. They sent me a screenshot. I reached out to the group owners, just like, Hey, like some of the things you said, um, I wasn't focused on them being mean. They just weren't true about how free up works. So I said, Hey, I'd love to, to clarify how free up works and, and just uh, happy to answer any of your questions about the platform. I don't expect you to take the post down, but I want to make sure you have the right information. She ignored me. She blocked me, whatever. So a few weeks later, I get a, a tweet from someone saying, hey, I was checking out free up, but then I saw this bad post about you and I want like more information. And so I reached out and I said, hey, call me. This is my cell phone. She called me. I answered any questions. I said, listen, I'm just going to tell you the, the way that I see it, the, the answers that, that I think are correct. And, and you can go from there. Well, she ended up applying, getting into the marketplace and became one of the highest paying freelancers on the platform, obviously making free up a lot of money too, because of that person that bashed me. That's how she first heard about me to begin with. So sometimes, not always, it all does come around full circle. And I could have gotten defensive. I could have yelled. I could have cursed back. I could have made my own post blasting that. But because I handled it in a more professional way, I, I made up for it down the line. Yeah, so you had to with real courtesy and grace. And we waste so much of our time, don't we? We have so much of our energy and thinking, getting upset, taking it personally, getting defensive, going on the attack. But that doesn't solve the problem. So you can, with a clear mind, you can start thinking about solutions. Yeah, agreed. I mean, for me, I follow a strict process of problem solving. I get all the information. I look at what resources I have available. I see what are the different options. I pick the option, the plan that I think is going to succeed the most. I execute that plan using all the resources. And then finally, the step that everyone forgets is I put a step in place to make sure that same problem doesn't happen again. And if you take that mentality on going on podcasts, you take that mentality solving a customer service issue, you take that mentality of a bad month in your business, that's how you're going to move forward and get better. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. It's very simple and easy. And again, it's thinking with clear mind. So you haven't got all that negative stuff coming out, clouding your decisions and your judgments. Now, along the way, I'm guessing you made some pivotal decisions that enabled you to have all the success that you've had. Can you share any one of those pivotal decisions that suddenly took you from this level up to there? Yeah, so I would say two things. First of all, the affiliate program for free up, I think was one of my, my better decisions. Um, second, getting an office was probably one of my worst decisions and getting rid of that within a year or so. What was a really good decision that going forward, I know, hey, I want to be remote. I like the remote lifestyle. I work better in that environment. And I think lastly, just committing to podcasts. So when I first started free up, I wanted to be on podcasts and I wanted to become a, a speaker at conferences and going to a bunch of conferences and being a speaker after six months, I was like, this is exhausting. I don't want to do this consistently. So I, I gave that up, but on podcasting, I mean, I'm a natural introvert. Me being on podcasts, like every single week, isn't my, my, my comfort zone. So go to say speak, but um, I, and my first podcast didn't go that well. I was nervous. I didn't have stories. I, I, I didn't know what questions they were going to ask, but I didn't let that stop me. I kept getting better and better and really just committed to it going forward. And sure, there are days I wake up where I'm like, man, I'm tired today. Do I really want to like talk to someone for an hour and be on a podcast? But in my mentality, that's a big part of, of, of just moving forward. So I think that mindset of, Hey, 
I'm a podcast guy. I'm going to be a guest on podcast. That's a prime channel of my marketing going forward. What was a big decision? Yeah, I'm amazed. You're an introvert. Wow. <laughs> I would never have known that. The way that I define being an introvert is I, I kind of gain energy back from being alone. So I can I can do the extrovert stuff. I, I've been to conferences, after parties, like a podcast and all of that. But what I, I would say that's me releasing my energy. And when I'm not on the podcast, that's when I'm gaining the energy back, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's an exchange of energy. It's wonderful. Right. So, Nathan, Tell us more about your new venture and how our listeners and our, re, our listeners and our viewers can find out more about this new business that you started and how it would benefit them. Thank you. So if you go to outsourceschool.com, we are launching soon, depending on when this podcast comes out, I think we'll be out with our first course called Cracking the VA Code or IOTA Method. IOTA is I-O-T-M, interviewing, onboarding, training, managing, we're going to walk you through the exact processes we use to have an eight-figure business run by 35 full-time VAs. We didn't just snap our fingers, wake up, and hire 35 people. We had a real process that we put people through. You're going to see us interview people. You're going to watch us onboard. You're going to get cheat sheets to help you do it and save yourself a ton of time. You're going to learn how we run meetings, how we do task management, how we keep people around and have less than a 5% turnover. And if this course goes well, we have a lot of other ideas as well, like how to use a VA to get on podcasts, how to use a VA to run your social media. We got software coming down the pipeline, but it all comes with this first course. So definitely, if you know someone that wants to use VAs, that struggled with using VAs, tell them about it. Go to OutsourceSchool.com, join our newsletter. We've got lots of tips and helpful hints there. And check out the VA calculator if you go to OutsourceSchool.com slash VA calculator. Brilliant. I will definitely be having a look at that course because it sounds like something that I could really use as I'm building my team. And for everyone who's listening and watching, please go along and have a look. As Nathan says, there's lots of free stuff as well. <coughs> we will put up all the links at the end of this um, of the recording. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming along. And I'm really excited about your new venture. I have a funny feeling it's going to be super successful. <laughs> I hope so. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Hopefully I will talk in a few years. Well, we won't talk in a few years. We'll, we'll be on another podcast in a few years and who knows where we'll be. Who knows where we'll be. Rules evolving. And thank you everyone who's been listening and watching. Thank you for being here. Till next time. Bye-bye for now. Bye.